All right, everyone, welcome. Thanks for being here. I appreciate your flexibility in finding the room to which we were rescheduled and doing your best to be as comfortable as possible uh, in this room. I apologize if anyone ends up standing or very cramped, but uh, we just found out about this yesterday, unfortunately, and we're still going to have a good time and good conversation. Um, if anyone is looking for articles, there are a lot of you today. There are a lot of articles, but it might be necessary to, you know, let someone next to you who might not have a printed copy read it for a uh, second. It's a very short article. Should not be a problem. So it is my pleasure. And there's plenty. There's there's a lot of seats still. Well, a lot. That's exactly. There's there's a number of seats. Um, I'll be standing if anyone wants to hang out with me back here. That's that's more than welcome, but uh, most people should be able to sit down. So I do ask, since I'm going to introduce our moderator, and we're going to go ahead and get started. So if you still do need to sign in or grab lunch, I appreciate your uh, your quiet and attention even as you're getting the seat. And again, I apologize for the change of room. So we have with us today a veteran Tuesday Times Roundtable moderator. He has moderated several of these before, and is a quite engaging, interesting uh, moderator, and we're doing a topic very relevant and specific to uh, today's being Election Day. Um, so, adjunct professor um, Abdi Javazadeh is a soci uh, sociology adjunct professor and currently teaches in Honors College and Labor Studies. Hopefully none of this is out, out of date from when I got it from, from still, last semester. Still valid, yeah. But uh, Abdi uh, received his PhD from FIU and earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in, in sociology from FAU. <coughs> Originally from Iran, he came to the U.S. in 1976, where he studied and later worked as an engineer. He later returned to college to earn his sociology degrees. He is the author of Iranian Irony, Marxists Becoming Muslims, a study of how Marxist political activists became integrated into the 1979 Iranian Revolution. He's taught here at FIU since 2000, including many courses such as Sociology of Terrorism, political sociology, social theory, social deviancy, sociology in the Middle East, and sociology of sexuality. He's also lectured at St. Thomas, UM, um, and teaches an upper division course titled Religion, Terrorism, and Society. Um, if you do have any terrorists next to you that are storing your things or uh, bags, anything like that, please move them to under your chair so there are more room for people to sit down. And I will turn it over to Abdi for today's conversation. Thanks, Eric, very much. Um, Hi everybody. Um, this is particularly in in my field, especially when we're talking about sociology and political sociology. So, um, and I know this may be a little too late to hold this discussion. I think maybe it should have been last week, or not necessarily on the day of the elections. But I want to know how many of you have either voted or will vote today. A big part of you. That's hardly half. Okay. Um, well, that probably has to do with the, the low turnout, has to do with part of what I'm going to be talking about. Before we get into the civilities discussion, I wanted you to see some, um, I don't know how clear this is for those of you in the back. Are these lines clear? So, you know, the blue is non-Hispanic white and the red is the other way, non-Hispanic black, maybe these. And the green is Hispanic, and the purplish is other. Um, and we can see that whites have historically voted more, except for the blacks in 2008 and then 2012, which we both know are the years when uh, President Obama was elected, the both times. And then Hispanics, the lowest turnouts, uh, there are sociological reasons behind that, and then the other uh, sort of correspond with, with Hispanic vote. Uh, and you'll see the zigzagging, you know, up years, down years, up years, down years. And the up years and the down years had specifically to do with what kind of candidates we, we were facing and what kind of uh, alternatives we felt as Americans that are, and this is really interesting, the, the drop of the white elect electorate votes that whites are becoming less and less involved, historically speaking, uh, within. I'll go through these rather quickly. Uh, if you have questions, we can uh, talk to talk about it later. And as far as voting age is concerned, so the blue is 18 to 29, which is probably 99% of you. 
the red is 30 to 44 and then green is 45 to 60 and then 60 plus is purple and you see that the lowest would be those your age in terms of voting and the highest would be those over 60. So those who are over 60 have come to sort of believe that it's more important to vote than your population. And then the, the rest of the 30 to 44 and the 45 to 60 remain somewhere in the middle. Uh, and that's not, I don't think it's any of this is surprising to you. You probably knew that without even me telling you. Um, the, by education. So less than high school, you see that the higher your education is, the more likely it is that you would vote. Uh, which is a problem for you because you're highly educated at the same time young. So you have to make up your mind whether you're going to follow any of these two patterns. So less than high school is blue, so you see lower turnout. High school graduate, red, a little higher. And then some college, green, which would be most of you or some of you are graduating. Maybe I don't, are there any graduate students here? None? One? Okay. <laughs> Uh, one out of 70 ain't bad. And then uh, postgraduate, the highest. So the higher your education, the more likely it is that you will vote. Um, and these voting turnouts, oh, this is from 1980, and you, I'll just read the percentages. 52%, uh, and these are the percentage of the people that can vote. So anybody over um, 18 and anybody who can, who's, who's a citizen in, in the country. 53%, so it's usually from 49 to 52, 53% until 1996. And then we had the highest turnout here in 2008, and then uh, a little bit lower in 2012. It would be interesting to see the 2016 turnouts what do you think? Do you think that it will be higher than 54% this turnout? Yeah. Do you think more people are participating today mm -hmm. or in this election than the one before? Yeah. Because you feel... Why? I'm a little bit. <laughs> right. That's a, that's a basic consensus that people feel that uh, maybe by Donald Trump becoming president, there's a little bit of threat, especially for minorities, I want to say. Um, all right. So... That's the demographics. I just wanted you to sort of have an idea. What we will be talking about today is mostly civility and politics. That is, if you notice, in especially this election, not so much the ones before, and maybe a little contentious during Gore and Bush in 2000, but more so today, there's contention between the two sides. Uh, before I start the civility discussion, I just wanted to sort of get a sense, and you can shout out your answers, because that's the way I run class. Um, that is, the contentious parts, that is, we only have Democratic, capital D, and Republican, capital R, uh, are basically two parties. And do you think, or how many of you think that there is contentious grounds because we only have two parties rather than 10, 12, or 15, or 4, or 5, or 6? Do you think that it's because polarized that we have Democratic, then Republican, that there is contention among the population? Or do you think that uh, people are, are zealots? I, I have been to both Trump rallies, they're called rallies, I don't know if they're really rallies, and then Clinton rallies. And my experience is that, um, I mean, I, maybe I should clarify that I, just to be objective, I don't subscribe to either one, so just to tell you that I'm, I am objective. But both rallies, what I felt among the supporters is overzealousness. Do you know what that means? Being a zealot? That you're ideological, and it doesn't matter what the issue is, and it doesn't matter what you're talking about. Uh, you ardently, without any doubt, absolutely support your candidate. And you leave no room for doubt or questioning or anything. And uh, so both of these rallies, I felt that people are overzealous about their candidate. And I think that that zealous feeling, or being a zealot for your party, creates what we call this 
uncivility among the people that are involved and so basically no tolerance for the other uh, and you, you see that with especially I think when Donald Trump is talking he feeds that he feeds a lot of sort of contention and he has these great grand statements about how we're gonna make America great again and you know really general information that he never gets into specifics about I think that feeds a lot of this contention and it, it, it minimizes from what we call civility and being able to talk to each other and tolerate each other's point of view and get our points across. Uh, even when you watch the debates, did you all watch the three debates? I'm guessing those of you who are in here are also interested, you're not necessarily uh, here by obligation, right? You're here voluntarily, hopefully. Uh, so you've been interested in the process. You've been interested in watching the debates, whether it's presidential or vice presidential. And, and I'm guessing you know what the arguments are and you know what the issues have been. And uh, if, you, if you watch these debates, they're really going at, it, at each other sort of in a very contentious way. And they sometimes attack each other more personally. Certainly from Donald Trump's perspective, than, than Hillary Clinton's perspective, but nonetheless it's become a contentious issue. And civility has sort of lost its way. And if you look at some of the rallies that we've had for both candidates, um, you'll see that there's a lot of pushing and shoving going on, there's a lot of protests going on, there's a lot of, in general, intolerance going on. Um, I'm not sure if that's necessarily healthy for the democratic process. It's healthy if we can get our points across. But that's not necessarily healthy if points remain moot and not ever addressed. And uh, so this thing that I've had, that I have here, like civility is having good manners, being willing to listen, and showing concern for other people's feelings and opinions. But political civility requires more than politeness and respectful listening. It also requires a realization that we must live together and ultimately compromise on some things we differ in fundamental ways. Um, do you think, so this is also another question, do you think that the two-party system is a little bit of monopoly or do you think the two-party system serves our intentions and our requirements for the president well? Do you understand when I say monopoly? That it's been a game? Is, is that what you said? The game, like monopoly? <laughs> That's not what I mean when I say monopoly. <laughs> I mean it's dominated by two parties. That's, that's what I'm asking you. How many of you feel that, that we should have other options? That's not many of you. That's bad news. Or you're not raising your hand because you don't want to answer the question. Uh, because when I talk about this monopoly of two parties and how it really lends itself to the, uh, the I guess, uncivility of, of the way we talk, uh, I don't have many of my students who think that we should other op we should have other options, uh, and that's not a good thing because if you look at the history of both parties, that is the Democrats and Republicans, uh, that is basically from 20th century on to the 21st century. You'll see that uh, they especially became contentious during Roosevelt in the 1930s, 40s, and then they became more and more distanced in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and then but came back together in 1980s, 1990s, and today. So in the 2000s, they, they were com coming closer and closer. So if you ever look at uh, what's called the political almanac, are there any political science majors here? I hope so. Just two or three. Uh, if, if you ever look at political almanac, do you know what that is? It's a, it's a book that comes out the May of the new year, about the year before. So the political almanac for 2015 was out in May of 2016. And in there, uh, you can find the voting patterns. You can look at how Democrats in the Senate and, and, and as representatives and then Republicans as rep representatives in the Senate have voted for different issues. If you look at the political almanac, you'll see that more and more the voting pattern becomes like these two parties agree a lot of, on a lot of issues. There is contention on some issues that are especially moral and ethical. So for example, gay marriage, uh, for example, homosexual rights, for example, abortion, and so on. 
uh, family values and so on. Those are contentious issues which are moral issues. But when it comes to socioeconomic issues, sociopolitical issues, they're basically voting and they're basically running and pushing the same agenda. And that's why I think that monopoly in, in, our, in, 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 country, in our country is really dangerous. And that also goes back to a lot of you, and I've heard this over and over again, not just from students, but many people who are in voting and they think that they should be voting and this makes a big difference, who say, I'm, I'm, I'm voting for the lesser of the two evil. Mm -hmm. Right? You've heard that before. Yes. Now, voting for the lesser of the two evil in a dictatorial sense or setting makes sense. Right? There's a dictatorship, there are two people you can vote for, and you vote for the lesser evil. But in a democratic society, our choice should not be the lesser evil. It should be a variety of options, alternatives, and we vote for one, you know, one, one party or one person. And unfortunately, it's come to the point that, first of all, political power has been monopolized by Democrats and Republicans. And then second, we don't feel that we have an option to vote for anybody else. Of course, there's Jill Stein, there's Johnson, and they're sort of 3%, 2%, but they don't, get, they don't get a platform neither on mainstream media nor anywhere else. Believe it or not, well, believe it. Jill Stein's campaign, Green, Green Party, you know Jill Stein, right? Green Party? They called me to get a room for them at FIU which means they really have no resources. Do you think if Donald Trump wanted to talk at FIU or if Clinton wanted to talk at they would call me? They would call the president, right? They would call anybody that could get them an entire arena, not just a room. Which also speaks to what kind of possibilities do you have if you're not one of the two major parties. Right? All of this lends itself to contentious politics. So it looks like we only have a choice of two, and then the country looks like we're torn. Also, add to that the idea of winner-takes-all. Uh, if we don't have a winner-take-all system, that is, if you get the electoral college of, let's say, uh, one over the half, you get all of the votes, or the party winning because it gets all of the electoral college votes, then we would have a better system. So if, if the Green Party, for example, got, or the... Or the um, or the other parties, Socialist Party, Workers Party, Labor Party, Communist Party, whatever, Independent Party, if all of those got a certain portion of the vote, they should be represented in Congress by those votes, as opposed to winner take all. But we don't have that system, so it makes for contentious politics. Yes, you had? Yes, why doesn't the mainstream media not feature like, the independent um, candidates? <laughs> That's a good question. They legally have the right to censor. It's, it's legal to censor the other candidates. And so they choose not to. Uh, I'm not saying that it's any kind of conspiracy, but it's possible that mainstream media likes either one of the candidates or both candidates, and they think that our choices should be basically between those two. But I know for sure, and study after study, and it's not just my feeling about this, it's not that I've talked to people, because I haven't really done any scientific study on this, but if you read the studies, more and more Americans want other choices. Mm -hmm. you know, they, and that's why there are many people like yourselves who wanted to follow uh, Bernie Sanders, even though he ran through the Democratic Party. And in fact, part of the reason why he, he ran through the Democratic Party is because he felt that he has no chance if he runs independently, and which is true. Uh, just to begin with, this is, I've read this, uh, this is a study that was done in 2012, 2013. So just to become a presidential candidate, you need $32 million to just start that. Just to be a senatorial candidate, you need $12 million to start, and a representative, $7.5 million to start. So who has that kind of money? And those who don't have that kind of money have to be then represented by either one of the parties. If you push through the party, so, you know, Obama, I don't know if you know this, but President Obama, had he not written the book called The Audacity of Hope, you've heard of that book or read it, uh, which is right before he became president <coughs> and sold the 
initially a million copies. And so the money he made with that, <laughs> he paid off his and his wife's student loans. He would have been the first president in the White House with a student loan, uh, which would be sort of ironic. But so, you know, he didn't have much money, obviously. He was a lawyer who was making some money, but certainly not $32 million to start a campaign to become president. The reason why he was able to do that was because the Democratic Party sponsored him, right? The reason why Bernie Sanders was able to become a candidate is not because he had the money initially, he made it later on through those small contributions, but it's because the Democratic Party was behind him. If you're an independent, it's really hard to come up with $32 million. Um, and as you have seen, this election alone, both candidates, just, just the two, because the others don't have this kind of money, uh, have spent close to f uh, what is it, five billion dollars. You, you see where that kind of money has to come from, right? It has to come from certain, uh, certain deep pockets. And especially since I'm on the subject, if you know about Citizens United, which was a law passed by the Supreme Court in 2010, argues that uh, basically money is speech. So the more money you have, the more freedom of speech you have. Which means that's the kind of money you can contribute to somebody to somebody's campaign, you know, through the super PACs, uh, if you want to. The Koch brothers uh, vowed to contribute $900 million to their favorite candidate. $900 million compared to my and yours $35, right? So that gives you access. To, so if you look at these contentious politics between the two parties and you look at how money is involved and you look at how monopoly is involved it's really hard to think through that and it's really hard to think through civility and think about civility because a very large portion of the American population feels that they have been disenfranchised uh, because of the way that your choices are, 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 are presented that is only Democrat and only Republican. I had this past, not this past Sunday, but the Sunday before, somebody knock on my door at, at home, and I opened the door, and uh, here's a gentleman who's campaigning for Hillary, right? And so he said, I just wanted to remind you that you should go out and vote and f I'm for Hillary, and she's a good candidate, and so on. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm not going to vote for her, and nor am I going to vote for the other guy. And he turned into, this is a man who was working for Hillary's campaign, Hillary Clinton's campaign. He turned to me and said, I know, both options aren't really good options. <laughs> this, is a, this is a man who was working for Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, uh, uh, he's really being truthful. And nonetheless still working. I am sure, and again I haven't done this study, but just by what I've come to know, I am sure there are many people who either campaign for Clinton or Trump and, and, and even vote for either one of those two who aren't really satisfied with the way that their options have been panned out. So they probably want something else, but they think that, what am I going to do? Vote for the lesser evil, which is a really bad thing because that's dictatorial. That is, if you go to certain countries that are either totalitarian or authoritarian, which means that basically one party or one man or one person actually runs government and uh, you know there's maybe another candidate you say lesser of the two evil right um, but if you say that in a democratic setting it just doesn't make sense you have to have options you have to have other options to think about and also to think about these options beyond the mainstream media you can do this for entertainment's sake talk to people ask them how much they know beyond mainstream media about their own candidate. I bet you anything that you will run, you will not run into many people who have studied their favorite candidate, the person they voted for, beyond anything they've read or heard on mainstream media. It's very unlikely that they do. Which means, what are our sources of inf inf information when it comes to voting? It's basically one or the other, uh, or the other party. So again, it really contributes to a whole lot of um, contentious politics. How important is civility in American politics? Well, I mean, I, I personally really think that civility, that is, 
keeping it calm and keep the ideas flowing is a really important thing. And without it, civility, uh, without civility, uh, we're in a Hobbesian world, you know, short, natty, na- na- nasty, and brutish. And then you pop me over the head and you take what's mine, I pop the other person over the head and I take what's his. And so, you know, there's no what he calls social contract or order. And then we are in a world that cannot solve problems through politics, civility, and willingness to compromise are essential parts of politics. And I think that becomes more and more important if we have greater choices, if we have more choices. Uh, this kind of civility will, will lend itself to a better atmosphere for politics. Is civility on the wane in American politics? I can. I should ask you, do you think civility is on the wane? Do you think that people are becoming more and more uncivilized when they talk about politics in America? Yes. And do you think this is true now? Or do you think it's historically true? Or it's become true maybe in the past two or three elections? Are we less tolerant of other people's views? Yes. A lot of people were excluded from it in the first place. So, I mean, there was really no platform to discuss it. That's among women and people who are not landowning white guys. So, for a long <laughs> yeah. time, there was a lot of the population that was not involved in the politics in the first place. Uh, of course, they're going to be civil with each other, more or less. And yeah. as more people have gotten into the political process, that level of tolerance is has been shrinking and shrinking because Mm -hmm. we don't may I don't know if it's that we don't understand how to tolerate and coexist with our fellow human or we just don't want to as a society so you think also as a result of the exclusion that contention and incivility has become greater right yeah okay yes I think it's more like piggybacking off of what she said it's more people voting but also like the way that we could voice our opinions is more like we have more opportunities to do that whereas in the 50s you would just call your friends on the phone we have instagram facebook twitter so more information yeah so because of more information we have more grounds to argue yeah. or discuss and uh, right but more information should it lend itself to to more contentiousness so so more conflict between the supporters of different parties, you think? Or can we tolerate each other? And, and look, uh, maybe, so you know, this is what I'm thinking, maybe depending on what the candidates are proposing. So look, if, 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 if one of the candidates is constantly talking about exclusion, right? Exclusion of these guys, exclusion of these people, exclusion of... Uh, that makes already a contentious ground. Right, so you're talking about exclusion, and you're even saying, once I become president, I'm going to exclude a bunch of you. Right, so it becomes intensified in terms of how conflictual it is, and then it it, it breathes that ground. So I think uh, I really think that it is on the wane, but basically not just because exclusion—that's certainly an ingredient—but basically because we don't feel that there is much choice. And then also, I I think. The information is disseminated through these social media that you just mentioned is still mainstream. So I think we don't we don't really get anything beyond that. I, I was talking to a colleague, another professor, who was an ardent supporter of Clinton. And, you know, she goes around, tells everybody, and gives out very very active in her campaign. I asked her, "Do you know anything about Hillary Clinton beyond mainstream politics?" And she said no. Well, you understand? I mean, that's a problem. That is a problem for somebody who's supporting somebody based on what other people choose to give you. Right? You have to go study it for yourself, see what she's done, what she's said, how she's voted, you know, the politics that she's pushed, all of that, you know, historically, not just for a year or two. Um, so, is civility on the wane? Political polarization between the two major political parties has increased dramatically in the last 40 years, and with the polarization, civility has waned. Name calling, angry exchanges occur regularly on cable television uh, channels and radio talk shows. And these are, you know, the mainstream type. Who or what do you see most responsible for either the highs and the lows in civility of uh, American politics? So, this is. This is what I've been asking. Incivility is primarily the result of political polarization between the two political... You see, it's always the two political parties and nobody else. Uh, nobody else is really... <coughs> Those of you who... Vo- yes? So I just wanted to share something that goes with what we're discussing. I'm from Colombia. 
Colombia and in Colombia in 1948 until 1958, there was something called La Violencia, and it was a civil uh, war that lasted 10 years, and it was because uh, at that time Colombia only had two uh, political parties, Liberales y Conservadores, and during those 10 years, um, it is estimated that 200,000 uh, 200, to 100,000 people died. And they were As a result of the political conflict they would kill each other, for example, between the two parties. My cousin was from the other party. I will kill him because his yeah. ideology was different. Right, right. And it becomes ideological. I mean, that's a, that's a very precise word. Ideolo ideological meaning. Uh, you only have one political outlook on life and in politics, and anything beyond that is uh, incomprehensible and it's also not tolerated. So, I mean, that, that's probably a good example. So, if you have just two choices between the, the two monopolies, I think, it becomes more and more contentious as opposed to wider spectrum of, of political um, alternatives. Yes? Would you say that we're more polarized now than we were, like, say, in the mid 60s of the? <coughs> The debate about Vietnam and the civil rights? I think on general social issues we're more polarized, but, uh, but, but when, it, when you talk about the 60s in Vietnam, that's Vietnam as one issue, you know, anti-war movement, and then possibly depending on where in the 60s you're talking about, the civil rights movement. Right? So that was a lot of polarization, it's true. But it wasn't as evasive, I think, as it is here today, where there's a whole lot of areas that are that are contentious and and polarizing people. Um, I think one of the problems that arise today is still with the politics of exclusion. So we still have what we call minorities in this country. To this day, even though I, I teach this, right? I teach minorities and rights and ethnicities and and diversity and so on. To this day, I don't understand why somebody should be called a minority. I mean, I, I know why, but this is not a language that should be used in a democratic society, right? Minority. And minority doesn't mean minority by number, it means minority by power. So why are certain people still with less power, right? And, and I think people of minority status have lost more and more ground, so therefore more contentious. So more polarization in, in the country. And uh, I think because during the 1960s there was a push to get rid of that, you know, for the minorities to do better with more rights, political and economic, uh, that was subsiding whereas today's issues are increasing or, or enhancing. And I think that's, that's the basic difference. Uh, instability is primarily the result of political polarization between the two parties. The growth of cable news and increasing role of super PACs, you know what those are, right? These are uh, political affiliation parties that help the candidates and the parties. And social welfare groups that spend prodigiously in, on politics, advertisement, and added to the problem of fueling political polarization and, and, and incivility. Uh, again, the, the mainstream media, I don't know if well, you've been watching mainstream media or looking at it, but for the past 15 months has given Donald Trump a free platform, mm -hmm. right? He, and, and, and he feeds off of that. Um, Clinton possibly a little bit, but not as much as he has. So every, almost every day, you can check this, for the past 15, 14 months, Donald Trump has had a free platform by the ma mainstream media and I think this is a deeper issue with, it's not just in relation to politics, but mainstream media no longer, so you know, journalism, right? They no longer want to go to where the news is. They're, they want to sit there and the news to come to them. And Donald Trump is probably the best candidate for that. So he constantly talks about things that news creating, and so therefore they don't have to do anything, spend any time on investigating or anything else. So it it feeds the, the it, it feeds their 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 want of showing more contention and more um, incivility among the population. And I think that's really worked uh, when I'm when I was talking about the zealousness of both of both can of both uh, supporters. Yes. So to I guess bring it full circle, if we criticize 
mainstream media? What are examples of not mainstream media that are worth listening to? <laughs> if you email me, I'll, list, I'll send you a long list. But, <laughs> but right, I mean, there's democracy now. There's consortium news. There's all kinds of alternative news. And the, look, I don't think you should listen to the alternative news, the non-mainstream. But you should certainly, when I say you, all of us, uh, we should certainly keep an open mind to other sources of news. So you, you should be able to gather a wide variety of information and then decide on your own. I don't think anybody's necessarily right. You, know, they, you can't objectively be right in saying that this is the most objective way of spreading the news or panning out the news. But certainly you can use all these alternative sources and then decide on your own. But I don't think mainstream media single-handedly uh, is able to give us what we really require to know in order to make up our mind as to who to vote for. But I think that's maybe our fault. Um, I don't disagree, yes. yes. The fact that we want 24-hour news service has led to the decline of the quality of news. I mean, they have so much airtime that they need to fill. And when you have a candidate as contentious and says things, you know, as politicized as Donald Trump, it just fills in the airtime. Yes. So when you have to cover so much time, you don't really have a lot of news that people want to see. I think it's our fault that we ask for, you know, 24-hour media, and then when they give it to us, yeah. we complain and say that, you know, we don't like it. Sure, but I, I, I don't know, I mean, I agree that we are responsible, essentially that's true. But it's a cycle, so you know, uh, and one feeds from the other. We feed from the mainstream media and the mainstream media feeds from us. So um, in that dialectical, in that, in that cycle, I'm not sure if today you can say it's somebody's fault, but certainly it has to be talked about that that's, that shouldn't be the only source of information. And then once you find that out, then you also know that there are other sources of information, and they're also important, and they could be telling you the other parts of reality, then, then you're responsible. But I don't think single-handedly you can just pick on anybody and choose anybody and say, well, it's your fault. But because many people just don't know. Uh, by number, 96% of Americans get their news about anything from mainstream media. 96%. That's almost everybody. And so how are they going to know and how do they know there are other alternative sources? Uh, and I think what, what mainstream media does is it, it pretends to give you the alternative in the mainstream media. So but by that I mean you have uh, Fox News and then you have MSNBC and then you have CNN, right? They're all three of them. So forget the networks, NBC, CBS, ABC, right? But G these three cable channels, in relation to their news, they're all supposed to be the alternatives to the other. Meaning, MSNBC talks about these things, Fox talks about these things, and CNN about these things, and they're supposed to be alternatives. Whereas, in general, they're all mainstream. Right? And that's the danger of many people thinking, I don't watch Fox News, I only watch CNN, or I only watch MSNBC. That's still mainstream, mainstream news, but we cannot think beyond that. So, I, yeah, I, in, at some sense, it's in some uh, um, sort of level, I agree with you. But I don't know if everybody's informed that there are other alternative sources of news about the presidential candidates that we receive. There are. I'm not I'm not just sure that people know about it. Some you had your hand? Somebody? Yes. Um I don't know, I, I feel like I'm not getting what I was expecting when I came here. Like I am twenty three years old and I came here thinking Came here gonna, is to this room? Yes. I came here thinking I was gonna figure out why I I'm studying political science and oh, that's my fault. I don't yeah. watch TV and I don't I don't have a TV. I don't have internet in my house. I am only on the internet on my cell phone. I don't vote and why why I don't vote and why my granddad who is above 60 who literally barely speaks English is voting Republican. That's what I'm trying to figure out. And I feel like talking about mainstream media uh, like it feels like 
that's a really limiting answer to... Uh, sure, we can talk about other things. No, by, by no means do I want to limit uh, my, what my we talk about. Because my doesn't speak English, so he's not watching mainstream media. I'm not watching mainstream media, but I'm not voting. Why, why am I not voting? And why is my granddad voting? Why is my granddad 60 and he's voting Republican? He doesn't even speak English. I think, look, look. Uh, so, so I, I sort of, I don't know about your grandfather, but as far as your demographics, I don't. Uh, all right. He doesn't even know what's going on. He can't even read the ballot, and he's voting Republican. Yeah, you sound frustrated, but yes, I am. I am. I told him I was like, you know, that every time you vote Republican, you're voting against me and my children, yeah, and my children, etc. And he's and he. I don't, I don't know what right. Well, th- again, but listen, I, I sort of covered why your demographic uh, is not too much into voting. And, and I said it's because you don't see an option. I'm sure if, if you saw, you specifically, not people like you, but you, if you saw a third or a fourth possibility that spoke to your issues, you would probably get involved in vote. Like a right? curly-haired lady from a Caribbean island, like, hey, vote for me. <laughs> no, 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 your issues. <laughs> your issues, not your, not phenotypically, but, but your issues. Who cares about any of my issues? None of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I, I really... <laughs> well, tell me, what's, what's, what's one issue? It's huh? that, like, choose a candidate, please, but you can vote for, like, Senate position bills and everything. Like, you can still vote for what you care about in that section, even yeah. if the president oh. doesn't care. Yeah, there are issues and there are candidates. Yeah, just leave the president pass them. But just vote for everything else. Like that, yeah. That's what matters in this election. The presidential election, honestly, we have checks and balances for a reason. Our amendments and our senators and representatives is what's more important to us locally mm-hmm. than the president. Yeah. Right, but then there's the issue of gerrymandering. I mean, the, 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 we can get really tight with that and show that that's, it doesn't really work that way. But yeah, nominally, sure, that's, that's what it is. But what is, like, what is one issue that you're concerned with that's not addressed? Um, education, quality of education. Not price, per se, but like, I don't understand why uh, somebody from France could like, for example, France could come into our universities and like take over. They, they know everything before they even read the book because they learn that stuff I see. in elementary school, in middle school, in high school, and I'm learning it now at That's age 20, district. whatever. That's a school district voting issue. I'm an education major, so I know well, that works. Well, well, no, that's an issue, sure, but I don't well, think I don't think right. But you don't. You're not the only one who's concerned about this. There are millions of Americans who are concerned about it. But what I'm saying is, had you found a candidate that addresses the education issue, that is the quality of education, I'm sure you would be drawn to him or her. But unfortunately, these real issues that are basic, fundamental, with More most Americans. Right, aren't, aren't really addressed and it looks like you don't have a choice because if the two monopolies choose not to talk about it, you really don't have a choice. That's it. It's, it's, just, it's sort of like, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll, give the, I'll give you an example of a commodity. If you live in a neighborhood and Comcast has monopolized your neighborhood, right? You either go with Comcast or nothing, right? That's what, that, that's what a monopoly is. So you either go with the two candidates or nothing, and it doesn't feel good. Constantly, those who are in politics are looking into why is voter turnout in America so low? So we have among the 30 industrialized nations the lowest voter turnout. And constantly they're looking into why is it so low. Uh, Many people hypothesize, I think wrongly, that voter turnout is low because basically Americans are content. Right? They're okay, and it really doesn't matter to them who becomes president because they continue with life. Now, that is the wrong answer because if you look at the people who don't participate are actually people who are not doing well. So those who are not doing well are not participating rather than those who are doing well not participating. Which means those who don't participate, who don't do well or not doing well, don't feel they're represented politically right, through these two uh, these two parties. And that, I think that's why there's there's really, really low turnout. And the turnout during the midterm elections is usually, on average, half of the turnout. So 50% less 
than the turnout during the four years, the presidential elections. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that Americans don't feel that they're represented. And your issue is a very basic fundamental issue that everybody has questioned, everybody that's concerned with education, I'm saying, whether you're getting educated yourself or children, and there, it's, it's not addressed. It's legitimately not addressed. And so you feel frustrated. Who am I going to vote for that addresses you know, my issue. The issues of poverty, the issues of loss of middle classness, the issues of work, the issues of outsourcing, and I mean really, not saying I'll bring them back, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, all of the health issues, all kinds of insurance issues, none of these are really addressed and you're left to just think about the stuff that they do mention, which is not really fundamental and you're not alienated in this feeling. Tens of millions, possibly hundreds of millions of Americans agree with you. Um, and but you don't you don't get it anywhere. You don't you can't choose a candidate that talks about that. I think this is the last. Well, no. What can the public do? Okay, here it is to promote civility in political arena. The growth of political independence surely sends a message to political parties, which means it, it's almost non-existent. There are no really independents. But so far, partly because it is so hard to start successful third-party movements in America, this grows hasn't. Uh, had much impact on the political parties. Just like I was saying that there are no third, fourth, fifth parties um, that have a viable voice. And, and they're really, they're censored. Nobody, nobody really wants to, I mean mainstream media, nobody wants to really promote them. Do you see the current climate for civility changing uh, with grow growth of inequality? And certainly this has grown vastly. In 2012, when I was giving numbers of the inequality, at least the socioeconomic inequality in America, there were 400 people, 400 Americans, individuals, that have more money than the bottom 150 million, right? Half of the population. Today, in 2016, that 400 has become 25. So even more concentrated in wealth. So 25 individuals have more wealth than 150 million Americans, which is devastating inequality, at least socioeconomically, right? So as that grows, I think non-participation grows because people feel more and more alienated. With growing inequality, feckless political parties, even more irresponsible independent political groups and media, uh, goading everyone on, it is hard to see how civility will increase anytime soon. That's a little pessimistic, but here you have it. We're simply in one of these periods in American politics where polariz polarization and incivility dominate our politics, um, which is, this is yours, right? But let me get some of the questions, Amanda, and then I can yeah, wrap up, right? I have a little bit of time, yeah. Eric, Amanda, all right, yes. When it comes to the electoral college, um, I'm still learning so much about this. Like, what is the electoral college, and why does it kind of go over our popular vote? You want the simple answer? I'll give you <laughs> <laughs> the simple answer is because the founding fathers are yet to have to find the founding mother. There's, there's no <laughs> the founding fathers said that I mean, basically said that we cannot leave this important task of choosing a president to the lay people because we don't know enough. And so they wanted to create a buffer zone or buffer between the population and choosing the president and that would be the electoral vote, the electoral college. So they're sort of uh, protecting us who don't know enough to choose like, you know, a bad person. And so they have, that's why they put in that, and to this day, you know, 200 so many years, it's still in place. And many people have a problem with that, um, so yeah, that's why, that's why, so philosophically, that's why they chose to do it. We still think that, we still think that the population is too ignorant to choose the president, by, really, by, because our votes have a, it has symbolic meaning, it doesn't have legal meaning, you know that, right? And the legal meaning belongs to the Electoral College. The symbolic meaning belongs to us. But how is exactly like the people in the Electoral College chosen? We vote for them. When you go to vote, you, you vote for the next election. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? No? 
really? There's silence in the room about this. I, I, I kind of have a question. I was just been thinking how to work it. Um, it's English would work. English would work. <laughs> <laughs> it's pertaining to the whole electoral college, senate, and everything. How we, as the people, we vote for that, but the presidency is what mainstream media shows. Uh-huh. But we, we we're never shown who's running for senate or or yes, yes, all that. that's true. And I'm wondering. What kind of a difference would that make if they actually did allow us to see them? Because people go and vote and they see those names and they're like, I don't know any of these people. Right. And you probably know them because like every now and then a YouTube commercial comes up. It's like, vote for this person like right. because you remember that name, but you don't know anybody else. Again, uh, I think the, the, the entire election process is upside down. So the stuff that we should know, yeah. it's sort of, I don't want to say secret, but it's seldom talked about. And the stuff that we really don't need is always talked about, yeah. right? Um, so I think, sure, this is this is one of the very important issues that should be put out there by some media source so that we get to know them, or at least for us, like she said with the green shirt, that it's partially <laughs> our responsibility to go and find out. You can. I mean, it's not secret information. You can, but hardly anybody does. We all, again, 96% of us rely on mainstream media to decide everything for us. Or at least to give us the information about it, not necessarily decide it. So I, I agree that it, it should be out there. Look, in many countries, and I think, look, this is the democratic process I'm thinking. First of all, there should be way more than two. And in fact, if you go vote in different states, you'll see that sometimes there's 12, 13, 14 parties. And nobody knows about, again, for entertainment, go ask what these other parties are. Nobody will be able to tell you because you've never even heard about them. You don't even know that the parties exist, much less the candidates. Mm -hmm. So I think money should not have anything to do with campaigning. You should you should be given a certain amount of money and do what with it, with it what you want. Also, time frame. I don't think we should go through this process for 15 months. This is just it's it's mind-boggling how we have to hear about this 15 months. And it's the same thing over and over and over and over again. Give them a month, you know, let them talk about their issues, and then we decide. With the same amount of money. If you have more money, that shouldn't give you more right to get to us. That way they can actually condense their words and actually pertain. Right. And then, then they are forced to, like you said, to give us the real issues and talk about the real issues. Instead of this unlimited time, unlimited money, and... Of course, who's going to get get ahead? Those with a lot of time, those with a lot of money, and, and with a lot of support, which is not anything that I know of democratic. 